God's book begins in a way worthy of a king. He tells us what he wants us to know and nothing more. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything we can see and touch has a beginning. But the creator and owner of the universe has no beginning or end. He is the invisible, eternal spirit who can be everywhere at once. He sees and knows everything. Do you know his name? God has many names, but his most famous name is the Lord. In the original language of God's book, his name is Yahweh, which means the one who is, or simply, I am. The creation story continues with the king's description of the original earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It was time to prepare the planet for people. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. What did God do on the first day of creation? He commanded light to pierce the darkness. Later, the sun would shine on earth, but not on day one. God wants us to know that he is the source of light. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. God is pure like light. He cannot be defiled. Even when light shines on very dirty things, it is pure. God is perfect. God is holy. Did you notice who was there with God at the creation site? His Holy Spirit was there, hovering over the waters. His word was there too, speaking. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. The Holy Spirit of God and the word have always been with the one true God. That is why it can be said of the king, even when he alone existed, he was never alone. In six orderly days, the king created a beautiful, wonderful world. God simply spoke and perfectly designed marvels appeared. On the first day, God said, let there be light and there was light. On the second day, God made Earth's atmosphere with the blue sky we see and the invisible air we breathe. God designed the sky with a perfect mix of life-supporting gases such as oxygen and nitrogen. On the third day, God said, let dry ground appear. And that is what happened. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation. Instantly, grass, plants, flowers, and fruit began to grow, each with its own seed. On day four, God commanded the sun and moon to shine and to mark Earth's years, months, and days. He also made the stars. On day five, God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. And that is what happened. On the sixth day, God said, Let the earth bring forth every kind of animal, livestock, small animals, and wildlife. 
God made each living creature able to reproduce offspring of the same kind and to care for its young. And God saw that it was good. Peace reigned. In the beginning, all the animals were friendly. They did not kill and eat each other. The plants supplied their food. Order reigned. Like clockwork, the sun would keep the right distance from the earth. The moon would change from new moon to full moon. The earth would recycle its air, water, and waste. If ruled well, the kingdom of earth would never lack any good thing. It would be the ideal home for mankind. Each day of creation gives us a clue as to what God is like. Day one shows us that God is holy. He is perfect and pure, like light. Day two, God is all powerful. He made and maintains the atmosphere. Day three, God is good. He created thousands of plants and foods for us. Day four, God is faithful. The sun and the moon stay in their orbits. Day five, God is life. He put fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Day six, God is love. After God created the animals, it was time to form the creatures upon whom he would pour out his love. It was time to create the special beings who could reflect his holiness, power, goodness, faithfulness, life, and love. On the sixth day of creation, the king conversed within himself, God, his Holy Spirit, and his word, saying, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over all the earth and over all the creatures. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. When the scripture says that God created people in his own image, it does not mean that God is just like us. It means that we are to reflect his nature and personality. As Roman coins were later stamped with the emperor's image, so God's image was stamped on mankind. The first man and woman were created with the ability to think, love, and speak like their creator so that they could enjoy a close relationship with him. People were not made to be God's slaves, but God's friends. In creating humans in his own likeness, God gave them dominion. People were to care for and to rule the earth for God, to discover its secrets and use its resources wisely. Such capacities set mankind apart from the animal kingdom. To animals, God gave two dimensions, body and soul. To humans, God gave three dimensions, body, soul, and spirit. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The body was merely the house or tent into which God breathed man's soul and spirit. The soul was man's personal intellect, emotions, and will, which made it possible for man to think, feel, and choose. The spirit connected man to God. While the body equipped man to connect with the visible world, the spirit equipped man to connect with the invisible God. The Lord wanted humans to know him. People would be God's special treasure. Since God made them, he was not only their creator, but also their owner. The Lord God named the first man Adam, meaning of the earth, or simply man. 
Later, God would form the first woman, but before that, there were some preparations to make. Adam needed a home and a job. After making the first human body from dust and breathing life into it, God planted a garden in Eden somewhere in the Middle East. A crystal clear river flowed through the garden. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Lord God did not ask Adam if he wanted to live in Eden. God was man's creator owner. He knew what was best for man. Adam's garden home was filled with endless delights, things to see, hear, smell, touch, and taste, sparkling streams, singing birds, fragrant flowers, furry creatures, juicy fruits, crunchy vegetables, sweet berries, mysterious forests, colorful rocks, fascinating bugs, and a trillion other wonders waiting to be discovered. But man was made for more than exploring and eating. God made Adam to be head of the human race. God wanted Adam and his family to reign with him forever. But only those who can be trusted with small tasks can be given big tasks. So God gave Adam his first job, care for the garden. This garden was a perfect place. It had no thorns or weeds or bad insects. The climate was ideal and the soil was rich, yet it never rained. Instead, a mist came up from the earth and watered the ground. God also gave Adam another job, name the animals. The Lord brought the creatures to him to see what he would call them. Imagine the scene, a pair of animals with flowing manes and powerful legs gallop up. Adam studies them, strokes their backs, and names them horses. At the Creator's call, a huge bird with hooked beak and broad wings swoops down. Eagle, says Adam. Next, a beast in an orange coat with black stripes goes by. What do you think Adam called it? So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. Eden was the perfect place for man to get to know his Creator. It was time to give Adam a test. From the start, God and man were friends, but that friendship needed to be tested. The king of the universe would not fill his kingdom with subjects who were forced to submit to him. God loved Adam and had awesome plans for him and his future family. Because God wanted people and not puppets, he gave Adam one rule to obey. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. This was not a difficult command. Adam could eat any of the fruits in the garden, except one. By obeying this simple rule, Adam could show that he trusted his Creator to know what was best for him. What did God say would happen to Adam if he broke this rule? Did God tell Adam that if he ate the forbidden fruit, he must begin to do religious rituals, use prayer beads, fast, give alms, go to a church, synagogue, or mosque, and try to do enough good deeds to balance out his bad deeds? Is that what God said? No, that is not what God said. God told Adam, when you eat of it, you will surely die. Disobedience to God's law is called 
sin. The penalty for breaking God's rule would be death. In his book, the king calls this the law of sin and death. The king's law says that sin must be punished with death. Death means separation. If Adam disobeyed God's one rule, he would become like a broken branch which begins to wither and die the instant it is separated from its source of life. If Adam decided to do what he wanted to do instead of what the king of the universe told him to do, that would be an act of rebellion. That would be sin. Sin would end man's friendship with God. Sin would cause man's body to grow old and die. Sin would separate man's spirit, soul, and body from God forever. Sin is deadly. After God had given the first man a job to do and a rule to obey, it was time to form the first woman. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Did you notice who performed the first surgery and who arranged the first marriage? Yes, it was God. Woman means out of man. Later, Adam named his wife Eve, meaning mother of all. While God gave them different roles, he made the man and woman equal in value. Like Adam, Eve was created in the image of God. She too was made to know her creator owner, reflect his character, and enjoy a happy relationship with him forever. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Why did God rest on the seventh day? Because his work was finished. Also, by creating our world in six days and resting on the seventh, God established the seven-day week, a work-rest cycle still practiced worldwide. The Lord God cared for Adam and Eve like a wise and loving father. Each evening, he would come into the garden to walk and talk with them. They were happy and comfortable in his presence. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Imagine a perfect world inhabited by a perfect couple in close friendship with their perfect creator. That's how things were in the beginning. What went wrong? 